Hello, and welcome to the very first episode of the History of the Labour Party. Before we start, a quick word from me. This podcast will be a chronological history of the Labour Party, from its origins right through to its very recent history. It's my aim to create a well-rounded, balanced and fair podcast, one which allows the many different opinions, often of the very same events, to be equally heard. I'll be trying to make this podcast as accessible as possible, so don't worry if you don't know a lot about politics, that's why podcasts like this exist. I don't claim to be an expert of the Labour Party, although hopefully we all will be by the end of this podcast, so any thoughts or questions are most welcome. You can get in touch at historyofthelabourparty at gmail.com and you can also find us on Twitter at History of Labour. If you do enjoy this episode, please do share and help spread the word. And with that, let's begin. Like most historical journeys, to understand the Labour Party and why it came into existence, we have to know about what came before it. The Labour Party was formed in the year 1900. Although 120 years may not seem like such a long time ago, the world and Britain have drastically changed since then. When the Labour Party was first founded, the First World War was over a decade away from even happening. No women and very few working class men were allowed to vote. Ireland was still occupied by Britain, and the main political parties were the Tories and the Liberals. In this episode, we'll look at what existed before the founding of the Labour Party, how the unions had previously tried and failed to make their voice heard in Parliament, and also the steps that led to the actual creation of the Labour Party. In 1888, only 10% of men in manual jobs were a member of a union, but by 1914, this figure had increased to 33%. By the year 1900, trade union membership had grown to over 2 million. For context, the population at that time was about 38 million. This increased membership gave the unions greater influence and economic firepower than they had ever had before. Working with the Liberal Party, which at the time was one of the main two political parties, they created the so-called Lib Lab MPs. Now, Lib Lab MPs were MPs, members of Parliament, who ran under the Liberal Party banner, but who were funded by trade unions. Remember, it wasn't until 1911 that MPs actually got a salary, so hopeful MPs not only needed their campaigns financing, but also their living costs during their terms. These Lib Lab MPs generally towed the Liberal Party line, but they still had their own identity, especially when it came to votes on labour rights and working conditions. The first two Lib Lab MPs were elected in 1874. Yet whilst trade unions' membership continued to swell after this, Lib Lab MP numbers lagged and they really failed to increase in line with union membership. Throughout the 1890s, the relationship between the trade unions and the Liberal Party began to break down. This was primarily because the Liberal Party leadership were reluctant to allow Lib Lab MPs. There were clear differences in opinions, and there was growing friction within this uneasy marriage. I mean, a party for the working class, working through a party that was very much, absolutely, for the middle class. Well, that relationship was always going to be a rocky one. The formation of the Independent Labour Party in 1893 by Keir Hardy only sped up this deterioration and solidified the different stances of leftists and the Liberal Party. And yes, you heard me right. I did just say the Independent Labour Party. But please, please, please do not confuse the Independent Labour Party with the Labour Party. The Labour Party grew out of the Labour Representation Committee, which was founded in 1900. And whilst the Independent Labour Party did later become affiliated with the Labour Party, they were two separate entities. But don't worry, more on all of that later. Around this time, there were quite a few left-wing political groups who were trying to gain a parliamentary presence. However, the 1895 general election showed that of these different groups, 
the Independent Labour Party, which I'll now refer to just as the ILP, was the most dominant. But the election also showed how weak these parties were electorally. The ILP, whilst the largest left-wing party, still only won less than 1% of the national vote, and the party failed to gain a single MP. Whilst this was all going on, there was a growing sense within the unions that the status quo wasn't working. It was becoming apparent that unions exerting pressure on Parliament from the outside, it just wasn't an effective way of bringing about change. And it was at this time that some within the trade union movement started to believe that if unions wanted to enact big change, then they couldn't rely on the Liberals or on being a pressure group. No, instead, they had to make their own political entity and act through Parliament with their own direct voice. And so in 1899, a motion was passed by James Holmes of the Amalgamated Society of Railway Servants. I know, catchy name, right? The motion proposed holding a special trade union congress conference in order to bring all of those different left-wing political groups into alignment and under one banner. As someone who was originally from there, I do have to mention that this was proposed by its Doncaster branch. It was at this conference that the decision to form the Labour Representation Committee was taken. Crucially, Keir Hardy's motion passed, a motion which stated that the Labour Representation Committee should have its own policy and its own whips. For the record, the Labour Representation Committee was the first name given to the Labour Party, with the name being officially changed to the Labour Party in 1906. From now on, I will just use the abbreviation of LRC when talking about the Labour Representation Committee. This was a really important moment, as the LRC was a political operator that was not only funded by the unions, but also directly affiliated with them. It was a crucial moment as it brought all of those different left-wing parties under one banner and it made a collective group. What's really interesting to remember is that at this time, the unions of Britain and the LRC were not by any means a socialist organisation. Some unions had begun to have an increasing number of socialists within them, but suspicion between trade unions and socialists, that will be a theme that we see repeatedly in the early years of Labour. In fact, four out of five trade union members on the preparatory committee conference for the LRC were Lib Lab type men, not socialists. The remaining six members of the committee were much more typically socialist. At its first conference, an attempt by the Social Democratic Federation to get the LRC to commit to socialism actually failed to pass. And I think that just goes to show how right from the start, especially at the start, the Labour Party was a really broad church, from committed socialists right through to Lib Lab types. And as opposed to what we see today, the trade unions back at the start of the party were often the least left-wing part of the organisation. But just like many unions were hesitant about socialism, so too were they hesitant about this new LRC. The only large trade unions which actually attended the LRC's first conference and affiliated with the group straight away were the railway servants and the boot and shoe operatives. The union hesitance about its new political group is, is something that really characterises the early days of Labour. Originally, the trade unions wanted up to 70% of the LRC's executive committee to be made up of trade union representatives. However, Joseph Burgess successfully lobbied for a smaller executive committee, and in the end, just over half of the committee members came from the unions. It's pretty astonishing that the trade unions, with their millions of members, just agreed to allowing their influence to be decreased so much just like that. The best example of the trade union attitudes towards the LSC is that they failed to even put forward someone for the unpaid position of secretary of the LRC. In the end, it was the future Labour Prime Minister, Ramsay MacDonald, who took up the post. And he really took up the post. In fact, 
Because the LRC didn't and couldn't yet buy or rent a building, the first LRC meetings were actually held in McDonald's flat. And it continued that way until 1904. Now that's dedication. Now, no one could have imagined that in just over two decades, this odd political group run out of someone's back room would be in government. So who can blame the unions for taking a somewhat arm's length approach to start with? Imagine how you would have reacted in the year 1900 if you were being asked to affiliate your union to this strange alliance of left wing parties who were electorally untested, slightly socialist, and trying to get into Parliament in a way that the unions had never tried before. This was a radical strategy. A very, very radical strategy. I'm afraid that's all we've got time for this week. But do join us next week as we examine the LRC's first baby steps into the world of political life and parliamentary elections. After all, within just months of its founding the LRC will have to face its first general election. If you did like this first episode, then please do share and help spread the word about this podcast. Get in touch at historyofthelabourparty at gmail.com and come and say hi on Twitter at History of Labour. I'm Callum Tennant and thank you so much for listening. <laughs>